Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 679th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, the Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Wolfgang Tillmans and Mackenzie Wark. We're thrilled to welcome poet Isis Awad here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest and host. Few artists have shaped the scope of contemporary art and influenced a younger generation more than Wolfgang Tillmans. Since the early 1990s, his works have epitomized a new kind of subjectivity in photography, pairing intimacy and playfulness with social critique and the persistent questioning of existing values and hierarchy. Through his seamless integration of genres, subjects, techniques, and exhibition strategies, he has expanded conventional ways of approaching the medium, and his practice continues to address the fundamental question of what it means to create pictures in an increasingly image-saturated world. And our host today, Mackenzie Wark, is a writer and scholar. Wark is professor of culture and media at the New School in New York City. She joined in 2003, and she's the author of Reverse Cowgirl, among other things. Her book, Raving, comes out with Duke in spring 2023. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Mackenzie. Thank you, Chloe, and uh, my thanks to the uh, team at The Rail for uh, uh, the ongoing work of uh, keeping the series running. Uh, and hi, Wolfgang, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking to you today on the occasion of um, your ma uh, magnificent show here at uh, MoMA, To Look Without Fear. And what I thought I would do is start by uh, sharing the screen so people can see the installation of the show uh, and some images from the show. Now, if you haven't been to this show, folks, you have to go if you're in New York City. Like, you just absolutely have to go see this work uh, because this will not do justice to uh, some of the images that we're seeing. But uh, what I thought we'd do is look at some images and look at them in the context of the installation first. And then we'll, there's some other questions that I have. Uh, and after Wolfgang, Wolfgang and I have uh, spoken for a bit, we'll open it up to questions from the uh, from everybody else. All right, uh, this is one of the images in the show, um, and we talked a little bit about this uh, before. And as I understand, Wolfgang's practice is not to to publicly use photographs uh, of. Uh, nightlife before whatever scene it was from has is is over and gone. So there there are things about the obfuscation and the keeping out of visibility of certain worlds that are meaningful in in ways I think to both of us. But uh, Wolfgang, I, I wanted to ask you. Um, we'll, we'll look at the context of this image in the show in a minute. But I wanted to ask you what uh, we learned from the. Uh, collective experience of creating nightlife in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, and how you think that's part of a, an aesthetics and maybe even a politics that's meaningful to you? Um, I guess um, I experienced it as a, as a form, as, as a transition from being a small town boy, um, a teenager who was who heard about nightlife, who was too young to join nightlife, uh, to then at around the age of 16, uh, being able to sneak um, out on Saturday nights to go to Cologne or Dusseldorf and, uh, and have my first real adult club experiences. And then uh, I moved to Hamburg when I was 20 in 88 and in nine, which was exactly the summer of love and the break out of Acid House and, um, and 
um, at so it coincided this what might be the the last uh, um, sort of youth revolution in Europe in like of of that magnitude um, driven by music at least um, I happen to be of the age of being actually being able to be a participant and uh, that was so powerful an experience um, and my friends and I we felt at that time 89 uh, um, that yeah this has a profound impact on or would have an a profound impact on society if it was shared on a broader uh, scale and the um, uh, inseparable from the music culture the dance culture is of course uh, um, mdma and ecstasy um, the drug that that um, envelops the users in a great sense of empathy for people around them and um, and um, I mean one could say is this is just uh, chemically induced and it doesn't mean anything but uh, but it I think it really had profound impact on um, people experiencing um, a collective peaceful safe environment um, um and um yeah yeah I, and maybe it's just you know because i had um similar experiences in different parts of the world a little bit in germany that uh it's sort of like one of the the ways that i kind of come at the experience of your exhibition and i just want to move us on to uh an installation view uh, of how some of these images are arranged in the space. And uh, some things I, I dearly love about this show is the unpretentious way a lot of it's mounted. There are a few things in frames and a lot are uh, clipped or taped to the wall. Uh, and and it, it reads to me like a kind of DJ mix that you pass yourself through. Uh, and there are kind of heterogeneous kinds of images that one uh, gets to see without antagonism you, know, you can see the differences and relations between things so it, it really does feel to me like uh look without fear is you one way to, to read it as a kind of extension of you know to be dancing without fear around the bodies of others and and in proximity to others but i don't know does that make any sense to you as as maybe one way into this uh yeah um uh, this exhibition is the first since 2003 that I mounted in a fully chronological order. It starts um, in 1986 in the first room and ends in 2022 in the last room. And um, um, in the beginning, there are a lot of early pictures of uh, the nightlife techno scene, acid house scene. Um, and and um, in this room eight, so of two thirds through the show, um, it um, it this installation um, gives room to my continued interest in nightlife. No, this is not something that I left behind. But uh, for example, the uh, well-known picture of the cock kiss, the two guys kissing, uh, appears um, um, in room four. There are um, uh, so. Th I, without wanting to have things appear in every room, um, I uh, wanted to, um, yeah, like not group things by subject matter and sort of be done with it because that's not how I live. No, I still like to go out today and um, I still care about the things that I cared about 30 years ago. And um, in this um, installation, which includes works dating from 2003 to 2014 actually um, um, there is a um, sort of a confluence of political protest and um, and nightlife and the overlapping of it and um, this sort of the core of the room is uh, more around 2013-14 and um, and it contains um, um, on the left and on the far right, um, 
uh, two pictures that I took in St. Petersburg in 2014. And right in the middle, um, there are six uh, magazine spreads, uh, pages um, with um, interviews of LGBT activists I made in St. Petersburg in 2014. The picture we just saw um, um, is the black little square on the right um, down now it's on the far right but uh, if we go back to the corner view um, um, yeah um, the um, so the, I've, I was always aware of the um, precariousness and fragility of free um, uncontrolled nightlife spaces and um, in the middle, the amber colored picture is um, called the spectrum, the dagger, uh, which is a space that no longer is. And, uh, and at the time, um, 2013 or so, I felt um, this incredible preciousness when I was there um, of, um, you know, this is this one little nugget of a place um, where people can do what they want to do. And if this is gone, um, it's there's not one opening up right next to it and uh, and uh, on the far left the large picture the podium is um, um, called Blue Oyster Bar St. Petersburg and that is the last remaining gay um, and lesbian club in St. Petersburg 2014 um, after St. Petersburg in the late 1990s had about 20 gay um, places and um, on the far right um, is a photograph of the television screen in my room uh, mm. in Petersburg, which was badly tuned. And I felt, okay, I mean, this is, the, uh, this is what television could look like when it's censored, when a channel is shut down. And um, I um, wondered if I could photograph this television static because in historically, when you photographed televisions, you would always have these black diagonal bars. But in this yeah. case, um, it was a um, sort of an early generation flat screen, and uh, I had a new generation digital camera, and there was this overlap <laughs> with the moment. Um, old technology, new technology, it was pos possible to take this photograph of zero information, but when you step closely, really close, like six inches, suddenly the black and white picture uh, all turns into colors and it's all red, green, and blue. But the... Um, yeah, I, I, was, I wanted to ask you about, I nearly put that one in, in my choice, actually. Being for media studies, I was kind of fascinated by it. Wait, there's no scan lines. Maybe it's, maybe it's digital. It also made me think of... Um, uh, that the famous William Gibson line, you know, the the sky was the color of television tuned to a blank channel. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that, but maybe it means something different to the uh, the flat screen age. Uh, so there's one of the walls uh, in that room. Uh, I dearly love the two uh, large uh, prints uh, in this uh, particular arrangement. Um, do you want to say a little bit about the uh, the portrait on the right? Uh, the, the man with the, the blue tone. Um, this was um, also at the at the spectrum mm -hmm. and um, it's called Remy spectrum and um, and in that moment I um, uh, yeah I felt a sense of um, um, that I should um, pho photograph this moment and uh, and I had a small camera on me, and uh, and and I um, um, gathered from his glance that it was okay to take a picture, mm. and um, and um, and later we got to know each other, and um, and it's um, yeah, it's a picture that would not have been possible to make only about three four years before. Mm. Um, it's uh, it's really a an example where techno technology makes new art possible because this was at uh, incredibly low light uh, without flash um, with um, uh, the camera pushed to its highest sensitivity and um, and um, 
um, something that I been fascinated around that time, the early 2010s, uh, how technology, changing technology makes new pictures possible. Mm. Yeah, that to me, that's one of the real pleasures of the recent work uh, in the show is your uh, comfort with this like extraordinary resolution uh, that's possible uh, in some of these images and the way that the images will work at these completely different scales. Uh, you can look at these from the other side of the room and you can go and look at the kind of astonishing detail that's in it. And it seems to me that you, you have this kind of like comfort with all those layers. But I'm also really struck by um, the, I mean, like fragile has been a key word for you for a long time, but the, uh, the not just fragility, but the sort of delicacy and, and openness uh that's here in a kind of a gaze without possession like there's a way that i feel like you're not taking these images you're kind of present uh with who or whatever else is in them at the same time it's i mean it's it's something um i try you know it's something i can never be sure of um, um but um i sometimes feel um um photographers also have a have a duty to um, record something and I feel um, I've always felt that was actually the driving force behind me wanting to photograph nightlife was uh, to to um, make a witness of it to um, to keep a record of it um, because um, I was always aware that the this space is maybe one of the very few spaces on the planet where this can happen freely right now. And by recording it, by telling the story or keeping the picture maybe for some years later, um, it is a way to say that this has happened and that cannot be undone, um, in at least in, in the history books. And um, um, so, but I have never had an interest in um, the actual activity of continuous nightlife photography. Mm. So I've, um, even though I've done it for since 33 years exactly now, um, it maybe happens once a year or so that I feel so compelled that I have to do it. It's, it's not that I, um, um, that it's kind of, the way for me to access the crowd. I photographed um, from a perspective of being uh, being there as a participant, and sometimes the the enjoyment and or the suffering of having to take a picture is strong enough for me to get out the camera, then do it briefly. And um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was curious about that, and not just in relation to to nightlife. To what extent? As a photographer, it takes you out of uh, the world. It's like a distancing. Because like one of the, the joys of a lot of this work to me is, is a, like a feeling of intimacy with different moments and experiences uh, that the viewer can then have with the world. But what's, what's your relation in the act of taking the picture to that? Mm. Yeah, like I, like I said, it's... it's um, 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 it's it's not neutral no it, it the presence of a camera is um um is is a um large it's a large presence but which also has of course uh, changed dramatically in the last um, 30 years now when i um first um started to take pictures um in clubs um it was all, almost like um like i mean it was so rare that people photographed that it was kind of clear that you had license to do so no that you were there as a um with a um consent of course of the um people running the place and um and um um and i mean like then in the late 90s, the proliferation of the small compact cameras took over and, and I never understood why people were constantly taking pictures. I, I, um, uh, well, I actually understood. I, I realized that it is actually not the interest in the photographs, 
but it is uh, the interest in being seen taking pictures. Uh, <laughs> so, um, because that gives you a sense of purpose. No? You, you, like the one that takes pictures takes control, has some sort of charge. And uh, so to be seen doing that gives you some sort of other um, symbolic power or agency or involvement and and i always thought that's so like lame um, um it's uh, it's kind of a necessary it's a necessary thing i find to to record to to write history uh, or to make art um but as a continuous activity i um resented it since the late 90s uh, which of course then got superseded by uh, the crazy picture craziness that we're in today which rightfully has led to clubs mm -hmm. deciding to uh, say we just don't want any pictures taken here yeah I, you know like the the better new york raves follow the berlin practice they put a sticker over your over your uh, camera's lens but I, i'm i'm wondering where that principle is for you in in the rest of your practice so that are there situations where you decide not to photograph things that you might otherwise desire to um, I mean, I, um, in general, find it, um, have, have a quite a high threshold of, um, embarrassment <laughs> to, to ask somebody to, um, take their portrait. Um, it's, uh, and, and I found that, um, editorial work, magazine, mm -hmm. um, um, work, allows for a reason um, to engage in this portrait situation. Um, when, when you take a photograph for, like of a writer or of, of, of a scientist for a publication, it is uh, clear um, why we are together and why I am looking at the person. And, uh, and um, so it's, it's there, I've always, employed a mix of different reasons of why I took a picture of um, of somebody. So sometimes they are um, friends that are so close, um, and it doesn't happen with all friends the same way, um, but where I see, where I'm allowed, where I'm able to, to um, look at them almost in a, yeah, like continuous but non-intrusive, way yeah. um and then there are strangers where, which happens rarely that i take the courage to ask a stranger um and um and uh, the thing is um the relationship between photographer and photographed always is written into the photograph yeah and so taken for example a hidden picture or that's a, a telephoto picture um is you know is it you can see that it's a taken picture you can feel yeah. it and so i for example never take um long lens pictures of people no? because it just speaks a language that that i'm not interested in so it it is um, i need to be physically close to the person to also take a close picture yeah you know i spent a long time looking at images of uh queer and trans people and they're, so often they're images that were taken and not given uh, but the, the the sort of the delicacy in your portraits, regardless of who they are, the the, the sort of uh, level of intimacy with the subject, I think, is really striking, uh, and uh, I think I really admire about this work. I, I want to move on though to to this image, and we'll put it in in context in a minute. Um, I I dearly love the kind of um, there's almost like a democracy of objects or or situations in the work as to what could be of interest, what might have like beauty and interest and an idea going on. So yeah, how, there's there are several in this series, but what could you tell me about this one? Um, this is called a paper drop passage mm -hmm. from 2019. Um, it's um, a group of pictures that I began in 2001. Um, first with a, I mean, it, it came from a time when I realized that everything I do is happening on paper. Mm. Like literally everything, like be it be books, be it the prints and exhibitions, um, um, the photocopies, um, 
uh, ink jet prints, um, photographs, the, the wet photographs in the dark room or the dry um, prints um, um, uh, with uh, photocopy toner. Um, it's it's um, and and of course paper has been this fascination from the start. Um, and the reason why I photo why I hung uh, paper prints unframed in my exhibitions was not um, a grunge slacker aesthetic, which <laughs> it got misunder misinterpreted uh, for, but it's really like a um, admiration for the beauty of the and the power of this fragile object. Um, and I didn't want to hide it in a frame. But um, after 10 years, when the um, unframed hanging became um, my sort of expected trademark, I also inserted framed prints um, because frames, I mean, you know, I'm not anti frame because they do also something very, uh, um, very good and well. And um, but in 2001, I photographed a red um, monochrome sheet of paper uh, taped to the wall, curling onto itself, and it has a sense of it was falling. And so the name, uh, I named it Paper Drop. And um, four years later, I um, observed uh, um, a large uh, sheet of paper um, folded over on itself, photographic paper, and um, and I photographed it and the name uh, became a self-fulfilling prophecy <laughs> drop like uh, shape emerged and uh, and with yeah. the light shining from behind um, ricocheting through this tunnel of glossy paper almost creating a bulbous effect um, it's um, it's a subject matter I've come back to um, over the last 20 years but I cannot do them on demand um, I sometimes pause for three years. Uh, there has to be some an, a new appetite or interest um, in them. And this one in particular was like after a longer pause um, in the days between the year 2019 and 20, where I had a strong sense of passage and hence the title Paper Drop Passage. Um, and I, I wonder like if everybody sees, but it is like like a sheet of yeah. paper like this. And the um, the depth of field of the camera is is only at the edge of the paper. And um, there is no digital manipulation in this work, um, but there is no digital manipulation in, in any of my work. I, I just just love the to me, there's this tension between it as like a, a chance event that could have just happened and a thing that's just so perfectly uh controlled or, or you, could, you could sort of perceive it as somewhere between that of uh you know you, you could imagine a rostrum photographer spending all day setting this thing up maybe you did or just happening upon it you know in the corner of the studio and it could be either but, uh, i mean i like this um um either make the the sheet. No, I expose the sheet to a color that I um, that I work on to obtain this green, and um, but they are a very fragile balance where this sort of moment happens, where where it it uh, um, its simplicity um, becomes a picture in its own right. Mm. And, uh, and what I like about it also is is that uh, the curvature itself is a is is a, the result of a mathematical function between mm. uh, gravity that pulls the print down and the paper tension that makes would would want it to flip back, and, mm. and so it's like exactly this sort of resting equilibrium that um, determines the shape. And here's uh, another in that series uh, in uh, in context. And in fact, the one we just showed is on the left is is the smaller one, yeah. Yes, and uh, that's like a rare moment in the exhibition that's sort of out of time. You know, the the first the the one on the in the middle, paper drop red, is from 2006. Um, and here I felt I hung a much later one next to it, um, and. Uh, and the context for some of these is the reproductions from uh, newspapers. 
Yes, um, on the right, there is, um, it continues over three walls, um, an installation called Soldiers of the 90s, um, which um, maybe if you go back to, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, um, when I lived in New York in the mid 1990s, I noticed um, that there were often photographs of soldiers doing nothing on the front page of the New York Times and also of many European news, newspapers. And, um, and I was intrigued, like, why um, do picture editors think that this is a newsworthy picture? No? Like, what exactly is the function of this uh, to show um, um, like the presence of war, but not the atrocity of war, or even the fighting. Um, and um, and it was a it was a peculiar time that um, in the in the West, in, in the West one um, um, assumed that it was post Cold War and a time of of peace. Um, but of course, throughout the nineties there were wars, and uh, but soldiers were more seen or portrayed as peacekeeping, um, and um, and it was um, kind of a um, an inquiry that I collected um, over the following years. And what was interesting, I observed that the only uniformed men that were shown fighting and beating up people were soldiers, uh, were, were policemen. Like here in the far right, you can see uh, um, German um, riot police um, beating up uh, anti-nuclear power protesters um, or there's a striking picture in the on another wall from the Seattle riots in 1999 um, and so of what is that um, 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 dialectic of images yeah I, I maybe that that period after the the Berlin, Berlin wall fell as you could see now as a period of like their idea of peace and ours uh, the, the love parade is in the show, represented through some some news photos, for example, uh, a newspaper. Uh, but yeah, maybe we're, we're working on a kind of a different project mm -hmm. than uh, what uh, uh, the leaders of the so-called free world were. Um, but I don't know. Do you do you feel like that's still a fragile project that we're attempting in the, this era of neo-fascism and rising nationalism and so on? Like. I, I'm aware this has concerned you in terms of Brexit and the fate of the EU and so on. But, I mean, this work uh, is a project, a fragile one. Um, I mean, this particular work is dated. No, it's the 1990s. It's called Soldiers of the 90s, and it's from 1999, and uh, it's not speaking about today. Um, um, and um, the well, I mean the. Um, the fragility of the peace that we we felt was was um, lived in Europe in the last um, thirty years uh, has come into stark contrast. Obviously, um, this year, but actually, two thousand fourteen, um, um, it started um, uh, with you, Russia beginning a war mm. on Ukraine and the world somehow not quite noticing it yeah. and uh, and um, and something that I um, must really um, did reevaluate re in the beginning of the year was that um, I was just you know growing up in the 80s um, and nine uh, 80s um, there was always talk about American imperialism. And um, and it's really bizarre that nobody talked about Soviet Russian imperialism when you know it actually occupied several uh, like a dozen countries in Europe and and forced them to do what this imperial uh, power wanted to do and uh, to um, find ourselves with a completely old school vicious imperialistic power. Um, 900 kilometers from here in Berlin um, um, with a worldview that goes way back, you know, like you think like make America great again is, is some idea of 1950s white America. Um, but what um, uh, Putin 
is after is I don't know it's it goes way back in worldview, and it's a yeah it's a very existential shift um, um, where we are today. Yeah, indeed, and and where the uh, people of Ukraine are are suffering the consequences of the imposition of that uh, as we speak. Yeah, uh, this is. Um, uh, turning around from the perspective of the, the previous uh, image. Uh, and the, there's a, this room's interesting to me because it's a juxtaposition of the uh, stuff in relation to news and your work uh, without a camera and with the formal properties of printed paper and so on. How did, did those things end up together for chronological reasons or is there, did you want to sort of juxtapose these things against each other a bit here? Um, it, um... I mean, they coincided because I, I don't work in normally in series um, where I exclusively work in one on one type of work and then leave that behind and move on to the next. Um, um, and instead, um, they are continuous and overlapping um, interests of mine. And so around this time, this area in the exhibition is devoted to the early mid uh, mid 2000s and um and the um and this i guess centrality of um uh, the paper the photograph as object um um wanted to be in the core and so on the left there are two works that are called lighter that after the paper drop which is a sculpture that i photograph um, um here the photographs themselves are folded and that and that makes them um objects um very undeniably objects and they are um suddenly the photograph is rejecting its uh, usual function of representation normally people look besides the object and just only see what what it shows us no what does it represent and these photographs uh, answer back and say you're 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 looking at me um and um and on the right is a um uh work from the freischwimmer group of pictures and from 2004 which is uh, made only with uh, light and and no object um, and and this is um, uh, done gesturally with my hands um, on a dry uh, piece of photographic paper. So any suggestion of um, liquidity or object, uh, smoke or hair or anything, it's purely what the eye. What the, no, not the eye. It's the brain that projects that. Yeah. Into. Yeah, I, I, I love that in, in an era when everybody was get, starting to get fascinated with screens, just sort of interested in the materiality of photographic process. Uh, in, in these two, you know, kind of parallel ways, and, and you know, bringing the bring the paper to the fore. Uh, I just like this picture here, the um, the wall, no, because uh, the the wall that we look at um, almost in profile, no, it's it it just shows um, again the materiality of of yeah. um, the space and and the the thin works on thin walls and the different planes. <laughs> um, that is the sort of thing you would observe. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, that's what I do, you know, like, like, yeah. uh, I mean, like these 16 days in the, in the exhibition uh, that I worked um, installing the exhibition uh, from day till midnight in the evenings. Uh, it's all about uh, covering every square meter of wall and space with attention. So every yeah. space that is where there's no pictures was as considered as the space where there are pictures. Yeah, um, it could be just me, but but to me, it's like uh, uh, feeling it as a dance floor that I've moved through, and there's a mix that that is leading me to experience it in certain ways. Was how I kind of felt about it, and the the attention to how it's hung is truly extraordinary. That's why I'm really encouraging people to go see it. Uh, like in that yeah. moment when you're standing here, you suddenly see how the orange from the um, the city view um, on the left 
mm. jumps over to the orange of the lighter on the right. It's something you only see in this transition, but that's something I take great pleasure in. And it's kind of an afterglow. And, mm. uh, and I can very much sympathize with your description of it being a, um, um, an experience, how you describe it, or, or that they, it is like a score, or there it's are... Uh, echo. So many pleasures like that, and and some of the photos are very small. So you're looking at these large prints, and then your eye is drawn to uh, like a tiny little array, and so forth. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it's a real pleasure. Uh, and we're back at that one. I, I maybe I'll move on to the one yeah. after. That. Uh, this this one is uh, uh, as we'll see. It's very very large in the show. Uh, the one of the little things about many things about it that astonished me that you the viewers won't be able to see here is like the incredibly fine-grained detail of the ridges on the green cap is 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 sort of precisely in in focus uh and your sort of eye is drawn to that uh, uh some things are not so sharp and it seems very intentional what is and what isn't uh and it's uh this this is one where the cell phone does appear like this object that's become so central to uh photography as as a vernacular practice but you, do you want to tell us a little bit about about this one and how the cell phone ends up uh in in your show here um there's also an interesting detail that you, you can read the um sell by date of the <laughs> um which was some time last year, but the picture is from 2020. <laughs> it's called Lüneburg Self, and um, and um, I mean I've I've been fascinated by the um, by the uh, smartphone, um, I guess since it landed in my hand, and um, um, and it's been and the transition of the 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 transition of the transfer of power it promises it promised in the years around 2014 uh, when they moved from the very crude first uh, editions um and uh 2014 15 and um and 16 I, I was sort of fascinated by the language that um uh, phone manufacturers developed around um and around these new devices and um, um, alerting to the consumer, alerting consumers to the fact that they can now live stream their life, you know, that they can carry <laughs> entire volumes of, um, of movie data with them. And it inspired me one day to, um, um, to um, write, uh, to speak the lyrics to the song Device Control which then became, which which I then made into a dance track, and uh, which was a tongue-in-cheek um, um, uh, adoration, admiration of it. Um, but the, as much as I was aware of the significance of this item, I was also aware how difficult it is to photograph it, mm -hmm. um, and um, and I um, I have photographed it occasionally photographed also the gesture of people telephoning um but um but it's uh it's just so bloody obvious no? that it's, it's almost difficult it's impossible to take a photograph of it and um and i was in hospital in 2020 in the autumn um having had metal taken out of uh, my knee in a uh, after a knee injury um operation and um and I was um, on the phone um, on a FaceTime call um, with my boyfriend, and and he and I leaned the um, phone against this water bottle, and and I liked this balance. I, I liked the this the the everyday sculptures that we make um, balancing our phone, um, and. And then he left the room, or left his room, and um, and I suddenly realized like this is so crazy. This window, this window from from one city in one country into another city in another country, and I saw this glass, uh, this glass surface, and the silicone of the of the bumper around mm. the protector, 
and then this glass body of the of the water bottle and and it so happened that i took my actual big slr camera to hospital somehow i don't know why I th but i thought let's take it along and i had it within reach and so i was actually able with a really good camera to and as it, suddenly the picture presented itself to me even though i set it up but I didn't set it up as a sculpture, but the whole thing presented itself back to me. And, and I had the means to photograph it. And uh, you see myself in the little picture on the left um, um, with a sort of um, big lens. Um, and that's why it is a called Nuneburg self. It's a self portrait. Um, mm. and, um, yeah, there's, there's so many things about this that I, that I love. The, uh, the light of a different day, the telesthesia, the, the other city being the subject of my first book, so I was drawn to that. Uh, had how to photograph the cell phone uh, as a formal problem and, and a solution to that. Uh, I, maybe it's maybe it's also given that you give a context for this one. It's it's a kind of queer photograph, uh, but but where it's 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 not obvious that that's what it's doing as well. Uh, you know, it's about a certain kind of relationship one can have with somebody. Uh, yeah. And I think, yeah. But straight people can have that too. Oh, well, well exa exactly. But maybe it's queer when they do it as well. When you're like chatting to somebody in another, completely through a device in another place. Like, what is that then? You know, what kind of relationship is that? Uh, and we have uh, an installation view of that one. Um, yeah, and do you want to tell me a bit about how you've arranged the array of things that you would experience this one in relation to? This was, the, this is in the last room. Mm. And uh, and uh, of course, the last room in an exhibition like this um, um, always carried great weight, and it was the last sort of. Uh, of course, it was, always was an open question in the in the year, in the final year before what would be there, and and um, and uh, what could be the statement, or will there be a statement? And um, and in the end, I'm I'm really really happy how the um, room worked out that there is on the one hand um, um, sort of a big confession to my continued love of portraiture on yeah. the right so this this sort of very compact uh, um, um, installation of um, of um, larger uh, portraits um, and then postcard size ones um, taped in between that um, um, that kind of as could all be in the place of the larger ones um, there is like a, a, a depth um, it's not an in, diff, in infinite depth of portraits available because there is only a handful a year that um, that really arrive um, and um, and the the room has a much calmer um, uh, set up it's it's uh, there is a linear rhythm around it um, and and on the um, left there is a picture called crossing the international dateline um, which is about the verge of what a camera sensor can see um, and it's so um, cooked up in a way that um, that again there is a um, um, it's not clear what you see, are there stars in the night sky or is it just an electron not knowing, is it charged or is it not charged? And mm. uh, opposite um, in the room is the next picture. Um, in if you scroll, oh, is there? Uh, really? no. Yeah, we don't, have, we don't have the other side of the room. Oh, yes. um, yeah. well, well, anyway, it's, um, it's kind of a, um, um, a um, Special, like a, um, I like that the room is is a bit suspended, and and there is an interest in minerals um, going around the room mm -hmm. uh, on all other walls that you don't see now. Um, this huge um, picture of concrete being poured, and a picture of the moon, and a rock on a beach where you can't quite tell the scale, and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, I, I, I love the arrays of uh, portraits uh, as, as a way of letting the viewer into wow. the 
the editing process in a sense as well. Like the, you know, as, as you say, each of the little ones could also have been the big one. So you're kind of like seeing the process of, of what the selection would actually even be. Although the, I got to tell you, the picture I loved in this room is that tiny little one right by the door, which is two or three men on a blanket. Uh, and you see that what brand of sneakers they have and all that. You could almost date the picture from the sneakers in it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just this sense of um, many of your pictures seem very precise about the time that they happen. You get a sense that this is the texture of a particular moment. Oh, that's uh, wonderful I, that you picked that one up. Yeah. It's a little bit uh, Memento Mori. Um, it's a uh, um, photograph during the installation period of um, the exhibition we in at wheels in brussels in 2020 and and uh, and it shows uh, um, anders clausen and micha amstadt and juan pablo echeverry who assisted me in in setting up the show after we did a shopping spree on a sunday morning <laughs> at the market and picked up all sorts of uh, insane materials and furry fabrics and uh, and made this campsite in the middle of the exhibition space, and uh, and it's a uh, sort of um, um, yeah, like uh, the presence of this this installation periods, the two weeks prior to the opening, which which are an incredibly a special period, uh, also of friendship with the people I work in, and uh, and um, this year. Um, there was a the incredibly sad loss of Juan Pablo Echeverry, an Colombian artist who um, installed eight exhibitions um, on the African continent over the last five years uh, with us, and uh, and he uh, died in June um, of a sudden and uh, an undetected um, malaria infection, um, and. So it's kind of the last picture. Um, I'm sorry that you've lost a friend, and it's a it's a beautiful memorial. That it's the last thing that most people would see as you're leaving the exhibition. It's a picture that he's in from from an installation and, and from the the labor of of making shows. Yeah. And there's also one next to the Frank Ocean portrait. Um, so yeah. Ah right, yeah. I was so tempted to put that one in the the slideshow, I guess, but maybe that's a, a oh, but it's too much talked about. It's okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's 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 and and for people who haven't seen it, go see the go see it for real and see the detail in it. It's astonishing, but we don't need to talk about that one. It's been much discussed. Um, yeah, and here's uh, a, a close up. This is not the whole thing, but it just gives us uh, the the frame within the frame within the frame, but then not the larger frame uh, kind of around it. Um, and there's uh, you with the the giant SLR kind of uh, on the bed. Uh, and I think with, then we then we can look outside the show at the little, uh, the work that ends. Any last thoughts on, on this one that you wanted to share? Um, um, I'm, I'm just grateful that the picture happened because yeah. even though I'm responsible for all elements of it, I, um, I couldn't have thought it up. You know, I was aware of everything. Um, I physically did everything, but I didn't intentionally do it. And then at the same time, the intention and, uh, and um, openness to, to do it, to take it was there. And and that confluence of uh, of uh, chance and control is um, mm. is um, is often beyond uh, planning, and um, and I'm yeah I can I can sort of humbly accept that I made it. I mean, to to me, that's that's just what is so astonishing about the overwhelming majority of these photographs is is that balance of chance and control and having the. Uh, presence and openness to uh, know where the frame is and where the image is to sort of select from the world uh, given there are too many images and there's too much world but here are these you know beautiful fragile specific moments that you're kind of selecting from it uh, with a certain democracy too is another thing I really love about this that where that could be could be kind of anywhere uh, it's astonishingly refreshing to see this show I have to tell you I was so it, it made my day Oh, Although I also, I the, the first time I saw the show, I saw it backwards. I went in the wrong way. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, 
that's good. Um, I, I have so often found that that um, um, I mean, you, you know, I think an exhibition in one direction, and then I realize that, of course, twenty percent or X percent of people go the other way, and it actually works the same way. But this, um, the next slide, um, is um, is um, an independent work from from two thousand and one that. Um, is um, that I made with the German sculptor Isa Gensken, and it's called Science Fiction, to be happy or to be content in the here and now. And, um, and uh, it was first, um, it was uh, commissioned by the Museum Ludwig um, in Cologne um, and opened um, only a few weeks after 9-11 in 2001 and, um, and people, approached it. it it was it mounted in a giant uh, empty um, room and um, and you approached it via a descending staircase and and all you could see is these two towers with this glowing red oh. which was um, uh, something again we, we never anticipated mm -hmm. at all or you couldn't have another work was produced long before in the earlier part of 2001 um, and um, and it's um, it has so many different um, resonances and and um, and uh, speaks about, of course, the interconnection of sculpture and uh, photography. And um, but it's also deeply a deep homage to clubbing from both mm. of us. Um, um, and um, and it's. Um, it's a space that, uh, yeah, I really invite, uh, like that invites to explore and play yeah. with your eyes. You know? Like when you look at the next picture, um, you see how the mirror effect extends the picture way yeah. beyond its its um, its um, width, and and the picture plays with uh, three different light sources um, in the aftermath um, after um, a party uh, closing, leaving a studio of mine in London. Um, and uh, and it's, yeah, it's very joyful. Yeah, there, there's a, and this is a, another series of yours, yeah, is, is after the party is, is one of the little threads uh, in the show as well. There's something very tender about it too, just sort of imagining all the things that happen uh, and this is like bottles and trash and stuff lying around. Uh, but uh, it also gives you that sense of the temporariness of the world that we're in. Uh, I, I don't know if you've seen this with uh, uh, an audience, but everybody's taking selfies in front of the mirrors all the time. <laughs> it's a very different experience. <laughs> if you're yeah. there with, I'm not criticizing that. It's kind of fun to see people play with it and have, you know, I agree because I mean here also the camera actually really um, enhances the work because you know this this uh, um, infinity that um, two facing mirrors that are parallel create is is that you can never see it yourself. No, whereas if you extend your arm, you suddenly get the full effect, and so it's it, it is um, really nice um, how uh, people interact with it. Yeah, and it's it's sort of lovely to see people feel that they can loosen their gallery manners a little bit and and sort of have fun and chat a little bit and and picture each other and so forth. It sort of really works. Uh, very different context to when it was first uh, uh, installed, as you're describing. And I got to confess, I have a picture of myself and my girlfriend in front of the mirror, and so I kind of <laughs> got into it too, you know. Um, yeah, no, I think that's the the end of our slideshow. I'll stop there. I'm going to open it to uh, questions in a minute, and I think there's questions in the chat, uh, so I'll come back to that. Um, the the last thing I just wanted to um, throw out there is a, a, a actually the the question I really want to ask is what music are you listening to? Ah. Oh, um... I don't know if it goes, it's the same with you, but I go blank the moment I get <laughs> uh, asked that. Um, yeah. But, um, but it's, um, let's just, like one song uh, came to the mind as you ask, uh, it's called mm -hmm. Only Human uh, by X Propaganda, uh, which is a, 
um, a band called Propaganda uh, in the 1980s um, from Düsseldorf, produced by Trevor Horn, and they uh, reformed um, almost 40 years later and recorded new material and had some legal issues, I guess, with the name. That's why oh. the band is called X Propaganda, and, um, and that song is quite amazing, Only Human. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to look that up on Spotify later. <laughs> And, and of course, it's 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 so pure music business. They probably don't own their own name. Yeah, but I have uh, I have made a um, a playlist that is no less than ten and a half hours long um, during the time <laughs> of the installation um, in New York uh, because Freeze Magazine asked me to um, to compile one, and they probably expected a dozen tracks. <laughs> and, and I, made uh, uh, 132 tracks uh, which um, somehow all played a role in my life um, and the 35 year span of the exhibition so that's uh, up on spotify and and uh, I, I, again. I have tried to do my homework i've not listened to 10 hours of playlist i have to i have to confess it may, maybe i'll maybe playing if i have a party sometime soon i and i just gotta I, I've, I have been listening to your music and the the one that sticks in my head is are we late for the webinar uh, it just always makes me laugh, and particularly I had to throw it in here because we're doing a webinar that neither of us were, of course, late like for. I'm very punctual, uh, <laughs> but but I got to tell you, and, and to me, maybe this is random, but are we late for the webinar? For me, forms a bookend with the famous uh, Jean Baudrillard line, which was, "What are you doing after the orgy?" So to me, that ends a certain era, but we're now in the era of, "Are you late for the webinar?" I don't know if that makes any sense, but it seems to me there's a difference in. I like in, that. Uh, and feeling as and now we're all in webinars all the time uh and uh and if there are orgies we want to talk about them you know because there's a sort of uh, obfuscation and uh uh you know non-visibility of certain worlds we should leave alone true i like that uh all right so let me uh open it up to the floor if people would like to put questions in the chat um let me just see if i can find some to throw at you uh this one is from david uh do you feel the presence of the camera is a necessary evil or else how do you feel about what the camera does to the environment especially if no people are around sorry what about the people around uh or else how do you feel about what the camera does to the environment especially if no people are around I mean, like, yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I see the camera in a more fond way than just as a necessary evil. Um, um, it's also, you know, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, um, it's fantastic what it can do, and um, and um, and to a little bit have learned about optics and and how a lens works uh, uh, early on has has so much enriched my understanding of uh, speaking this language um so um but yeah the the um i was never the photographer in school you not know, like i came to photography really late you know, it, it wasn't how i um was ac accessing social scenes or do today um, but it's interesting you asking about the presence of the camera in um, um, where there's no people, and um, um, and I guess it's um, it's it's a it's a place of of um, projection, projecting hope um, that um, that what you just did will come out well and in the era of film of course this was really uh, fully intact this triangle of uh, uh, the photographer the subject and the hope um, that this might turn out well but you could never see or be sure of what you've just done and that made this a uh, very directly psychological um, element of photography so real and then with the digital cameras where you can see on the back what you've just done um 
um, it, it was a real process for me to unlearn that, to not look at it in uh, with the goal to understand what I just did, but to just see it as a technical tool to see if I if there's camera shake or something went wrong, um, and to keep this triangle of hope intact. Also makes me think of your early and ongoing interest in uh, telescopes, as you know, image making where where the this there isn't a human subject or or mm -hmm. subject at all. Uh, let me uh, um, look for other questions here. Uh, Karen wants to know, are the large clip hung photos printed on Hanemula mat? Um, I, um, I usually don't sort of go into product names, you know, like I, I uh, like to speak about the camera that I use as a full format uh, chip SLR. Um, and um, and the the paper and the the inks that I use is um, is um, readily it's all all the techniques and technical um, things I use are freely available. They're at the usually like top end of the consumer market. No? So there's no um, special effects, no um, no sort of out of reach. Um, material because I um, like like the cameras I want to be close to um, to um, yeah that it's not a supernatural perspective and the um, and the paper comes out of a research of what is available on the market and I've, I've um, been working on getting exactly these textures uh, um, um, and and that I think it's good for anybody, everybody to discover that for themselves. You're you're not uh, not being sponsored by uh, any particular company here. No. Uh, I I'm sorry, I got to I got to ask the other questions, and if I have time, we'll come back to you. Karen is shaking her hand. She just happens to be next to me on the screen. Yeah, Karen. But Karen, can I ask the other ones, and I'll come back to you? Uh, let's so that everybody gets uh, gets their first shot. Yeah. Uh, Alexander asks, how do you find the opportunity to take new photos after what's already been taken at this time? Um, I mean, that, um, you know, this, it should be impossible, but of course not. Um, the, um, because the parameters of culture and civilization are constantly changing um, and so the progression of time and and um, development of civilization and the development of technology alone if you just take these three huge um, parameters as they are constantly changing um, new pictures um, are bound to be able to happen and so I um, I, um, even though it must be hard to be a, uh, to be starting taking pictures today, I, I would say no, I mean, it is, it is an incredibly unique time. And, um, and, um, and I had to ask myself the question, what is missing? You know, like what is not represented? How do I not see myself represented? Um, and, um, and that is a good start um, to ask yourself, what is missing? Charlie uh, wants to know if you uh, have uh, thoughts on the new images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, yeah, I mean, I um, I love, I, I obviously love them. I um, I learned about it in 2007. So it's been a long wait for me, um, I think like 14 years uh, um, to finally see it launch and, um, and um, yeah, I, my, my reaction when seeing the first bunch um, was um, that if, I mean, it's just so powerful, if, if uh, this isn't uh, inducing humility and, and peace in people, then, then what is? No? I mean, like, uh, I, it just makes, um, um, I mean, how can you turn life and earth into hell for others when you face 
just how small we are, just what a tiny um, speck in the larger picture we are. And so why would people uh, take the energy to make life hell for others or make life difficult for others? What, what is that? I mean, why on earth, um, what, what energy drives people? Um, so I, I have this belief that astronomy has potential uh, peaceful power. I love that. Uh, Jake says, uh, in seeing the show on a busy Saturday, something I was quite pleased to see is the level of engagement from a quite diverse audience, seeing older couples staring with wonder alongside young mothers and the younger children. Uh, do you consider your audience when you make work? Um, and what is the essence within your art that you think lends itself to seemingly any viewer? Um maybe too much to answer in this uh, uh, frame but um the the audience um i um i never i mean i i respect when artists say i don't care about my audience um i only do it for myself i, I respect this answer but i don't really believe it and uh, and personally i um me thinking about um, audiences in various um, moments um, does not mean that I'm pandering to a lowest common denominator or that I'm um, giving in or that I'm uh, dumbing down. Um, it's, it's quite the opposite. No? It's being feeling respectful for um, the people who um, come to this and in in um, um, like on the one hand, when I make work, there has to be a genuine interest and curiosity coming from within. But then when I make exhibitions, I do think about what um, will the people in that city have seen before? Um, when did I last show there? The very sort of, um, yeah, like thinking about I guess an author, um, a movie director, you also think about the context that it, this next project sits within. And, and so the New York has a very uh, special place there no? because people really go and see exhibitions. Um, and, um, and I know people that have seen every single one of them of mine since 94. Um, and at the same time, I make the exhibitions for maybe 10 people in mind that whose, whose judgment I really, really trust. No? And I know when that is um, okay, then it will be also fine for the others. Uh, at least you asked a question I don't think you could answer, which is how your, your work relates to my ideas. But I'll just say your work speaks to what I've been trying to do for 30 years. So that, that would be my answer. Uh, Sandra, uh, says is curious about the processes that have gone into the print of the video of the leg as you enter the exhibition. I love the lo-fi quality and the slightly off angle. Do you, do you know which one that's referring to? It's right at the entrance, outside the entrance. Um, it's called Leg, and it's from 2017. It's it's um, it's vertical and. Um, and I mean, it's uh, I, I'm not offended by it being described as lo-fi um, <laughs> <laughs> because it is actually um, a high definition video um, and uh, and it's in focus and it's all OK, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it is um, it is um, presented here in a in a day or like light lit situation so the contrast is low and that's something that I am like that I accepted that I embraced um, that um, um, and that that it has this um, 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 kind of slightly soft quality um, and Oh, to be freeze. Here we go. Um, um, from just two meters away, super sideways. Um, um, but yeah, no, I. Um, 
that's um, all I can say. Gabrielle is interested in the uh, video installations and how some of them you work in the music and the lyrics. And could you talk more about your interest in exploring developing those pieces? Um, yeah, you're referring to the to room ten, which um, um, is is one fifty two minute work called Moon and Earthlight. Um, it's a sound. It's an album. It's a continuous piece of eighteen pieces, and um, to which I also made a, um, um, a film. Uh, so it is one. Uh, it's one on the one hand a listening room, and it is also a film work and an installation um, um, with the sound panels and this this uh, particular um, illuminate fabric, which also features in some of the films. Um, and um, and um, yeah, and the um, the music um, is is my music, and and um, of and. and I think when I started to make music again uh, after a 30 year hiatus in 2015, it was language um, that led me to do so almost. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, the, the interest of words, working with words, um, um, not just in titles of photographs, but um, um, actual lyrics um, has come to become like a, a proper part of my practice in the last six years. And uh, there's there's also the uh, Tillman's Reader, if people are interested in uh, Wolfgang as, as writer, as well as visual artist and uh, musician. I want to say beat maker too. I was actually dancing in, in your, your show because uh, they should be dancing in in art shows right and so I got into that but I got some funny looks for it but when I read when I read a, um, an interview with you um, there was a, a, a line saying you can't, you can't escape this world or this space and and it uh, um, and it resonated with a song that I made mm -hmm. two years ago called can't escape into space we're in it yes um, Yes, and I had the pleasure of hearing that with your music video of it, sort of sitting on a beanbag. For I needed a rest when I was when I was in that room. Um, we're running a little bit out of time. I think I can get in one more question, and then Fong has a question, and we have our poet to conclude. Uh, will you talk about uh, the mouse uh, in envelope photo at some point? An image I've held in mind since ninety eight or ninety nine, whenever it was that book cover one I keep carrying with me. This is from Douglas. Oh, that's very sweet. Um, that, um, um, I mean, it obviously um, holds meaning uh, without the story, without knowing, and, and that's of course how I, how I um, view my work, you know, that it should uh, do what it does in response to the viewer. Um, and the viewer should ideally see themselves in uh, in some of the pictures, obviously not in all, um, have have contact points with them and and obviously we're not all the same. so there might be a response to um, a tactileness of the the fur of this uh, um, uh, toy animal. Or, or other resonances that might happen or might not happen. But in this particular like personal instance, it was um, it was um, uh, uh, um, an envelope, uh, a mouse from Steiff um, uh, that uh, my boyfriend Jochen sent to me, um, just simply put into an envelope, and uh, and um, and I always kept it in it, or just peeking out, um, and um, and it became. Yeah, like a, um, a keepsake um, and and just like a, um, um, you know, how partners have like diminutive uh, uh, names for each other and uh, this sort of playfulness. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking all of your pictures are like, like keepsakes from the world from different, different obviously very different kinds of intimacies with objects and situations and scenes. 
Just because uh, I called her name, uh, like, should we just briefly ask Karen, Karen? Yes, of course. Karen, if you're still there. Yes. Karen, you You'd have to unmute. Yay. <laughs> anyway, I, I use Hannah Mule matte paper. And I love it so much for the depth and the richness of the color. And I was really struck in seeing your huge, huge prints and how beautiful they were. And I just wanted to say that you've inspired me to not frame and to let people really see that quality that gets totally lost when you put glass on top of it. And that depth that you have in the scale is just remarkable. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Uh, Fong, if you're there, I believe you have. Um... I'm here. I'm here. Thank you, Mackenzie. Wolfgang, this is amazing. Thank you so much for coming on to our NSE and allow this gathering of warmth. It's uh, not webinar. <laughs> at all for sure <laughs> but you know you know when i was in college uh, i always had this dream coming to new york from philadelphia and when i did finally come to new york i was super lucky one epic new year reading at the the poetry project must have been 95 i sat right behind jonas makers and alan ginsburg so i say to both of them I admire what you have done, stood and fought for the counterculture. One day, I would love to create a magazine like that. And they both look back and they say, we not counterculture, Fong, we are culture. <laughs> <laughs> it was so amazing. So in the course of, you know, I don't know, last month or so, I began rereading, believe it or not, Fear and Trembling, Soren Kierkegaard, great book that I read in college and reread it again. And then he say, similarly, once you label me, you negate me, you know? So, so what it, I mentioned that because it was in college that I came to reading, and of course, the great Nan Golden, The Ballad of Sexual Dependency. Mm -hmm. And I want, that's my first question, Wolfgang. Is there a relationship to Nan's work? You know, when, I mean, you've been, what, 15 years younger? Um, that was a very important book for me, and that's why I want to live in the East Village, you know? So that's my first question. My second question is because of the recent book published by our friend Raymond Foyle of Gregory Corso. The book is called The Golden Dot. There's a line in it that I love so much. This is how it happened. At the end, everything that was dwindled into a dot. The dot exploded into the void and the beginning began again. So I felt your work, among all the things being discussed here, you know, Mackenzie, I feel like Wolfgang is a benevolent anarchist. There is a, you know, the anarchy. Uh, well, that, that's your thing for you. The <laughs> 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 anarchist is your thing. Yeah, but come on, Wolfgang. Uh, that's two questions for you. Uh, well, I think we are really short of time now. No, obviously, the the uh, there is a relationship with Nan Golden um, in in how we are we are generations of artists who are connected through interests, shared interests. And that is, um, that goes through, um, you know, like seeing seeing Diane Abbas um, um, on 20th Street last month, um, thinking like, wow, like how, how, how there is uh, so much seeded there. And then of course, in previous generations, in previous generations in, painters um, um, on in the 19th century, um, we only exist because of the other artists that came before us. Um, and um, and uh, that's why I, lo I like looking at art and, um, 
And the second question I see more as a statement that you made and uh, <laughs> fine. So, um, but cool, I liked, uh, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, you guys. This is fantastic. Um, yeah, so we can uh, uh, wait in a second for the, the poetry reading. Back to you. Thank you so much, Mackenzie, and thank you, Wolfgang, for this amazing conversation today. Um, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our NSC events with the poetry reading, and it's absolutely my pleasure to introduce our Poet Laureate of the Day, Isis Awad. Isis Awad is a curator, writer, and poet based in Brooklyn. She's the founding director of Executive Care, an art organization at the service of trans and queer artists of color from performance and nightlife communities. And over to you, Isis. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chloe, so much. Um, I'm going to be, and thank you all for this fab conversation and for having me. Um, I'm going to read a few shorter, newer writing. Um, and it's interesting how I feel like there's a lot of throw lines between, or I found like just in listening to the, the conversation, how there were through lines between my writing and um, some of the things that were discussed or brought up at least. Um, OK, so. Uh, my mother was a slut. She took her veil off and dyed her bob red when she moved to Kuwait where she had me. I used to be better at remembering her, but now I only see her in vivid dreams that I forget within 10 minutes of waking. I used to open her closet and sink into her hanging clothes, inhale her scent and cry about it. Her clothes were fab and too tight. She used to ask me to stand guard as she crept out to her second shift at work so my dad wouldn't see her outfit and start a fight with her. She was addicted to Diet Coke. She drank upwards of six bottles a day. She never cooked and was always late to pick us up from school. She did make one dish though, beef with black pepper, and it was just that. We celebrated it when she'd ever make it. My mom didn't get mad at me like I thought she would when I came home one day with a baby chicken that I kept as a pet but she always took her bra off in front of me, which I secretly believe contributed to my transness. My mom once took us away on vacation, just me and my sisters, just us girls, to a fancy hotel on the Sinai coast. We never told my cheap ass dad or my brother because we didn't want to fight about it. My mom used to ask me to pluck the hairs on her legs that her wax missed with a tweezer. And she had secret conversations on the phone with a man friend from work who I vaguely remember speaking to a few times, who my sister got in trouble with my emasculated father about one day when he spat on her. My mother told me never to let, uh, never to let a man put anything up my ass. She told me about rape and serial killers who kidnapped little boys to fuck them. Without context, I hadn't a clue what she was talking about, but I always loved my mother's attention. Um, this one's called Party. Um, bodies among bodies, searing aluminum heat. Leave that shit to soak. Some things I can't unhear. Some things I can't unspeak. Keep me up at night. Interrupt my ability to concentrate and digest. The words coming out of my sister's mouth, my mentor's mouth. The idea of a mosh pit has never appealed to me. Lust grabs my hips and pulls me closer, self-defeat but I'm not there anymore. The greatest lesson you'll ever learn is knowing when to leave the party. Um, okay. Spent and dehydrated, lead you to the staff bathroom because I have the keys. I'm right where I want you to be, stuck on your scent, peanut butter, strawberry seed, cologne and sweaty pits. Damn, you smell good. Behemoth betrothed, bewilderd, kiss me senselessly. I want to consume you, but I digress. It's not affirming to me to make the first move anymore. Whoever said every kiss begins with K has never had that bitter taste of it doesn't even fucking matter on their lips. I only accept candy from strangers. 
Um, and then this is the last one I'll share. Um, look me in the eye when I pass a glance at you. Fight the urge to blatantly flirt with you, I do. Wonder what it would feel like to rewatch that episode in your arms. We would spend the whole day in bed. I jokingly try to get up and you pull me back. You cry to a sad scene and I stop myself from holding you tighter. I create moments for you to find me alone. I've not slept in days. Long gone are the mornings of Brunola and Chia. Let's carry each other through this spiral. Swooping sparrows could never. Nestled between your tail feathers, I don't think it's chic to deny oneself the taste of new connection. Innocence travels from your lips to mine. Touch me like I've never been touched before. Unadulterated desire without the confusion. Desire that make you wanna do it all without questioning it, without naming it. Lick it like it's foreign to both of us. Fascination is the cousin of evil. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Isis. That was amazing. Thank you very, very much. And thank you again, to Mackenzie and Wolfgang, for such an incredible and generous conversation today. Um, it's just been an absolute pleasure. We'd also, of course, like to thank the teams at MoMA and David Zwerner for helping prepare in advance of today's event and the team at Wolfgang Studio. Uh, and we'd like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making conversations like this one possible, as well as supporting our archive. For 22 years, The Rail has provided a platform for arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like here on our daily NSC. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at The Rail. And if you're free on Monday, Halloween at 1 p.m., you can join us for a conversation with Danny and Sheila Restack and Amanda Gluibitzi on the events of Cut, Cuts in the Day at Camden Art Center in London. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Sua Yu. And as Israel tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Thanks to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. And go see the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. Epic. Epic.